people of God, grace to you and peace. I want to welcome you to a sermon on Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. This is the assigned lectionary text for the second Sunday in Lent. This year that falls on February 28th, 2021. So as is our custom, we begin with the lesson. Then Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the Gospel lesson this week begins immediately after Peter's great confession. You remember, right? Jesus asked the disciples, Who do people say that I am? And the disciples list what they've heard. Well, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets, which is almost certainly a polite way to refer to Moses. You remember the book of Deuteronomy, at the end of his life, Moses prophesied that at the end, God would send Israel another prophet like him. So Israel's been waiting for Moses to return. But then Jesus makes it personal. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answers immediately, you are the Messiah. Now Jesus orders them not to speak of this for reasons that will become instantly apparent. And he begins to teach them that whatever they expected Messiah to do or to be, they are unprepared for the actual path ahead. Instead of enjoying military conquests, national redemption, personal achievement, they were going to watch Jesus undergo great suffering, be completely rejected by the religious establishment, and suffer a brutal death. They don't even hear the promise that Jesus puts in there about a resurrection. And this makes no sense at all to Peter and the others. Messiah doesn't get killed. That, in fact, is the way a person recognizes a false Messiah. The real Messiah conquers. The real Messiah rules. The real Messiah restores. The real Messiah rewards his followers with a share of his glory. Peter takes it upon himself to correct Jesus, to rebuke Jesus. And Jesus will not have it. All trace of velvet disappears. All that's left is steel. Peter, your mind is not where it needs to be. You're thinking like a human being and not like God. In fact, you are functioning as Satan in this moment. Get behind me. Now... We've spent an awful lot of time focusing on the gentleness of Jesus, on his tenderness, on his patience, and this seems to be a completely different Jesus. Most of us are tempted to look away here. There must be something missing in this account, right? The, Peter must have been on Jesus' nerves. He must have been arguing with Jesus for days to produce this kind of reaction. Silly, silly Peter. It's different for us. Jesus would never speak to us in such a way. But even as we say it, we know it's nonsense. Jesus is nothing if not clear 
in what comes next. Let me remind you. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And speaking for the group, speaking for all of us, I want to take Jesus aside and rebuke him. This isn't what I have in mind at all. I want Jesus to be my helper, my ace. I want him to answer my prayers when things get hard. I want him to smooth my way. I want him to bless me with gifts and abilities beyond myself. I want him to help me come out on top, to pass the test, to get the promotion, to succeed. I want him to bless me with plenty and abundance. I want to be rich. I want to be first. Sure, he can bless others if he has the time or the inclination, but I do want what I want, and if it's them or me, let it be me. I want Jesus to take care of me and mine. In a world scarcity, I want my group, my tribe, my family to be at the top of his blessing, healing, and provision lists. Let me and mine not be hungry. Let me and mine be well. Let me and mine have our every need satisfied. Let me and mine be free and unencumbered and untroubled by the needs of others. I want Jesus to give me a certain, uh, an air of a certain depth and gravity. I want people to see me as a good person, a morally serious person. I want people to know that I'm religious, but not crazy religious, you understand. I, I want to be seen as stable. I want to be regarded as solid. I want Jesus to lend me his veneer of respectability. I want to borrow some of his standing. I'm a good person. I'm way better than some. Jesus certainly knows that. I want Jesus to get on board with my sensibilities. I want him to affirm my choices. I want him to baptize my politics. I want to be able to list him as a full supporter of my cultural sensibilities. I want him to laugh at the things I find funny. I want him to hate my enemies. I want him to approve of my choices. I want him to second my judgments. I want to be able to speak for him without ever wondering if he's really in agreement with me. I want him to be in agreement with me. I want Jesus to be my silent partner. The world is complicated and hard, and I can't afford to be seen as goofy or crazy, and so Jesus needs to understand that our relationship needs to be somewhat behind the scenes. I don't want him or his sensibilities to interfere with my path or with my choices. I'm doing the best I can. I'm actually doing pretty well. No one can reasonably expect more of me, and I want Jesus to get on board with that. I'm driving. He's riding shotgun. Get in, buckle up, be quiet. This is my life. And regarding the religious parts of my life, I want to be in charge of that too. I want Jesus to be my religious enforcer. I'll decide which sins are big and which are too small to worry over. I'll decide who is and who isn't a real Christian. I'll decide what needs to be confronted and who needs to be confronted. I'll decide how to use the Bible to defend myself and to convict others. Jesus should be proud of me that I'm reading the Bible at all. A lot of people don't, you know, and that's why they're so messed up. Jesus wants me to set them straight, and I am willing. But accountability? No, absolutely not. No one gets to tell me what to do or what I should believe. I've got this. And while we're on it, the money part of religiosity. 
Preachers should shut up about that. It's none of their business. They should stay in their lane. I work hard for my money. I throw a little at some of the stuff Jesus cares about, but never so much that it interferes with my goals, my objectives, my acquisitions, my plans, my toys. Jesus needs to understand that. I'm getting taxed to death down here, and if he wants me to give more, he's going to have to prime the pump. He's going to have to do something about the top of the ledger. Let's be realistic. So, in summary, in this world, I want to be able to count on Jesus' unflagging assistance in my march to greatness and self-actualization. And when I die, I want him to be my safety net. I want him to catch me when I close my eyes and bring me to my mansion in the sky, and it's gonna be nice. Streets of gold, you know. Is it only me? Is it only me that wants glory without suffering? Grace without obedience? Freedom without responsibility? Provision without cost? Redemption without conviction? Is it only me that wants honor and riches? Is it only me that wants more regard and more prosperity than Jesus received? Whatever it is you want, this is my confession. This is what I want. May God forgive me. You too? Perhaps we're a bit more like Peter than we care to admit, yes? Jesus knows, so he lays it down clearly for us. Our minds are on human things and not on the things of God. We are the enemy, the deceiver, the blind, the lost. In a word, Satan. How will we respond to that word? The church is always beset by heresies. She's always filled with hangers-on and pretenders and opportunists. She is always under attack from the world, the dark one, and from our old natures. But this feels like a special moment of confusion to me. A moment in which many of our brothers and sisters would hear the list of errors above and respond with, Amen! instead of with tears. This is a moment of public contending regarding what the gospel actually is. It's a moment of separation, of schism, of rending. We and they are hearing different masters and we cannot both be right. Yet Jesus couldn't be any clearer. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. This holy, Catholic, and apostolic faith is not a means of self-improvement, self-actualization, or self-aggrandizement. It's not a path to wealth. It doesn't exist to validate my choices or to backstop my sensibilities. It's not about my freedom or my rights. It's not about my priority or my centrality. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about his will, his commands, his work, his sensibilities. It's about the individual Christian decreasing that Christ might increase. It is, in the words of the Apostle Paul, a manner of living in which living is Christ and dying is gain. Jesus says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. It's the second Sunday of Lent, a season of confession and repentance. On this day, I call you to a simple awareness of the gulf between Jesus' call and your sensibilities. 
I invite you to meditate upon that gulf, to cry out to God for help and for strength, for rescue, to recommit yourself to a life of faithfulness and obedience, to acknowledge that only by God's grace can you be rescued from your mind and body of death. I call you to remember that Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So says the word in Philippians 2. I call you to practice awareness that you, me, all of us want anything but humility, service, and suffering. None of us want to deny ourselves. None of us want to follow this path. But I would also remind you that Jesus is the true Messiah. He is God eternal, bent low to join with us and to teach us and to bring us home. In him is no darkness, no deceit, no manipulation. He is the way and the truth and the life. His teachings can be trusted. His counsel is peace. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is power and provision. He is creator and king. He is light. He is the great lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the new Adam, the new Israel, the sinless one. He is the great I am in human flesh. And he calls you to follow him. What magnificent grace that is. I remind you that Jesus has chosen you. In your baptism, you were marked with the cross of Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit forever. You are not alone. You have never been alone. You cannot be forgotten. Jesus goes ahead of you to do what is necessary for your redemption. Jesus receives your efforts with grace. He is holding your hands as you learn to walk in his ways. He is watching over you with love as you learn the words and the ways of the coming kingdom. We will never supplant the master. It's more than enough that we might become like the master. It's not about us. We are his. He is your hope and your life, now and forever. Amen.